everyone! Today I'm sharing my hat and headpiece collection. I make headpieces to pair with the majority of my costumes since I love how they balance out the proportions of large sleeves or wide skirts. So over the last three years, I've collected a lot of hats and headpieces. This isn't even my entire headpiece collection. I'm only showing ones I could easily access that are still in wearable condition. So some of my older and more fragile pieces aren't included. As per usual, more information about everything shown in this video will be linked in the description box. So check that out if you're curious. All but one of these hats were made and drafted entirely by me, and I have videos or blog posts detailing the process for most of them. And with that said, I'm going to go ahead and get started since there's a lot to go through. Henin were the most popular headpieces throughout the 1400s and came in a variety of styles. This one is really simple and sits an inch away from the beginning of the hairline. When designing this, I focused a lot on the profile and making it slope at the same angle as my forehead. It has a base of interfacing with wire sewn into the edges to stiffen it. It's covered with a home decor fabric and has a long veil made from matching silk chiffon that was hemmed by hand. The bottom edge of the henin is trimmed with silver lace, then over top of that there's a gold beaded lace which has been further embellished with gold beads and silver sequins. It's fully lined with cotton with gold braid sewn into the interior. This is another very traditional headpiece. It's a French hood based on ones from the mid-1500s, and it was worn as part of a Tudor ensemble. It sits relatively far back on the head and is held in place by sculpting the wire in the hood to fit the head. It's actually a bit big for me, so I really need to sew combs into it, but I'm fond of the profile. It's made from interfacing and buckram that has wire sewn into the edges and it's covered with a mixture of brown velvet and silk dupioni. There is a velvet veil that falls down the back and ruffled lace trimming across the edges, and I beaded the crescent with glass pearls and montes in a pattern that matches the dress. One of my favorites is this heart-shaped headpiece, which is also called an escoufin. This was a complicated thing to make. It has an interfacing base but was heavily padded to form the shape I wanted. The side panels are covered with jacquard with a gold mesh overlay, and they are outlined with brocade piping. The top portion is stretch velvet with a small chiffon ruffle across the bottom edge. It's heavily embellished with glass seed beads, a ton of pearls, and a framed gold monte that sits at the center front. This headpiece is quite similar to the last one. It's in the same heart-shaped headpiece category, but this one has horns. It's made from interfacing and a ton of wire to keep it in shape. And after I achieved the silhouette I wanted, I focused a lot on the textures. Eight different materials went into this, including glittery mesh, brocade, iridescent chiffon, and many others. This piece is quite heavily beaded as well, with a variety of fake pearls and seed beads. At the front, there's a framed imitation opal, which I used as inspiration for the color scheme. A veil extends out from that stone and drapes over the top of the horns and down the back. This piece is a shallow-brimmed bonnet. It's made from heavyweight interfacing with wired edges. It's covered with red cotton sateen with matching ties and banding details across the back. This bonnet sits a bit too far back for my liking, but that was very common in the early 1800s. The banded portion of the bonnet is meant to cup the neck, with the cotton ruffle covering any escaped hair. The bonnet ties securely around the chin, keeping it in place. The interior is lined with cotton and gathered silk organza. The cap of the bonnet is a gathered piece of patchwork cotton eyelet fabric, and the brim of the bonnet is bound with a matching material. It's decorated with hand-dyed fake roses and sprays of small white flowers. This next piece is also a bonnet, but it sits much higher on the head and has a much broader brim. The silhouettes of bonnets became quite extreme in the 1830s, almost silly, much like the dresses from that time. Here you can really see the crazy shape of this bonnet. The back portion sits higher than the brim, which isn't something you'll see in any other era. This bonnet is made from wired interfacing. The pieces were covered with dark pink velvet before being sewn together. It's completely hard-shelled aside from the cute ruffle across the back. The interior is a bit rough, but the brim is fully lined with orange silk taffeta, and the cap is lined with striped taffeta. And I currently have a comb pinned to the lining to hold the bonnet onto my head. As far as details go, there are two bands of orange taffeta across the back of the bonnet. One band meets in a bow at the back, and the other continues down to create ties. And I apologize for all the lint here, it's pretty much unavoidable with velvet. Believe it or not, this is a sporting hat. Well, sort of. Tricorns were every lady's choice in the 18th century when it came to riding ensembles, but this is a more decorative take on those hats. 
It's made to be quite small and sit on top of the hairstyle rather than securely on the head. This has a base of interfacing and a cap made from buckram. It's covered with thick red wool and the edges are bound with gold brocade. This was probably one of the most difficult hats I've ever drafted since I was so particular about the size and shape. It took ages. Constructing it was time consuming too. There are sequins outlining the gold binding along with the beaded applique and tassel, all of which was hand sewn. The top of the hat is decorated with feathers and handmade flowers. The hat is unlined and has a comb sewn to the back to keep it in place. From a slightly later period, here's a simple straw hat. I reshaped the crown of this hat, but the base was store bought. It's trimmed with a strip of yellow cotton with a large matching bow at the back. It also has several fake flowers on it, along with an ostrich feather. In the end, it was very easy to put together and match to the project I paired it with perfectly. This hat is a similar style, but from a much later period. This was made to go with an 1890s dress, but is based on styles from the early 1900s. I call it my lily pad hat since that's what it makes me think of. This was made from buckram with several bands of wire sewn into the brim to support it. It's covered with dark purple taffeta and lined with cotton, tulle, and satin ribbon. But my favorite part are the huge decorations, including a massive ostrich feather and some fake flowers. I also added some purple goose feathers within the flora to tie it all together. Hats like this are so much fun to wear and I have quite a few Edwardian projects planned, mostly because I want to make more of them. This hat is a bicorn, or at least I think it is. It's based on a fashion plate from the 1890s. I had never seen anything like it before, but I fell in love with it. I'm not really the biggest fan of hats from the 1890s. I feel like they are out of proportion with the huge sleeves and skirts that were popular. So when I saw this, I had to make it. I used a brown silk for the exterior and cap. It's stretched over interfacing and stiffened with wire. The cap is lined with cotton, but the brim is lined with ruched silk taffeta. I decorated it with orange roses, leaves, and a peachy color feather that is draped across the top. And like a lot of my hats, it has a comb pinned into it to keep it securely in place when worn. This hat might be my favorite. I think this is the most adventurous hat I've made. It's called a flower pot hat since the crowns often looked like overturned pots. Mine is made from wired interfacing. The brim is larger in the front and curves up into two points at the back. It's covered in brown silk and bound with matching bias binding. The interior is red velvet and it has a matching sash around the crown. But the star of this hat is the bird. Hats decorated with birds were very common during the turn of the century. So common, in fact, that feather laws were put into place to save species from extinction. I've always found these hats quite fascinating and beautiful despite the morbidity, so I finally took the plunge and decided to make one. I used a golden pheasant pelt for mine, which I purchased online, then shaped and attached it to the hat. I love the colors in this pelt and the iridescence, though I don't think animal pelts are something I want to work with again anytime soon mostly because I'm allergic to them and they don't smell very pleasant either. On the other side of the hat, there's a bow and a few goose feathers. And like many of my other hats, this was kept in place with a comb. Jumping back in time, here's a cap based on ones from the 1850s and 60s. This cap has two bands lined with wire that can be formed to fit the head. The bands are covered with strips of wool flannel that extend past where the bands end and turn into ties that secure the cap in place. In between the bands, there is a cap portion, which is made from lace. I used a small piece of vintage lace for the base and a vintage napkin to form the ruffle that sits over top. I really love how it turned out and I just love this style in general and how nicely it hugs hairstyles from that time. This is a similar but more elaborate piece that is intended to be paired with ball gowns. It also has two bands, but the space between them is left open to reveal the hairstyle. One band goes across the top of the head and the other hugs the hair just above the neck. The bands meet around the ears and usually this portion is decorated with lace or flowers. Think really fancy and practical earmuffs. At the back there is a large lace ruffle that serves as a veil. I paired this with a fancy 1860s gown and I wanted this to be just as elaborate so I covered the bands with cotton sateen then decorated them with lace and sequins. The sides are covered with flowers and large beads, with a ruffle of chantilly lace across the back. The simplest headpiece I have to share may also be the most iconic. It was made famous in the 1920s and is known as the shingle band. 
I made mine to go with an Edwardian ensemble, and it sits straight across the forehead and is pinned in the back. Mine is made from embellished scraps of gold lace, with large crystals glued on for sparkle. I attached small ostrich feathers to it as well to add a bit of movement. I really love all the detail work on this piece, even though it's a relatively simple design. Speaking of detail work, this one has a lot of it. This is a Grecian-inspired crown based on sculptures I saw at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. I made it from interfacing, which was covered with satin face chiffon. The chiffon was embroidered, then covered with sequins. This was very time-consuming to make, but I love how much it sparkles and the texture it has. This headpiece is what I call medieval inspired, aka totally made up. It's made from wired interfacing and covered with upholstery velvet and orange shanting. This piece would likely look better with an updo with the chiffon veil at the back falling over top of it. But even with the inappropriate hairstyle, I'm still fond of this piece. It's heavily embellished with each edge outlined with two rows of pearls. And it has a starburst design on the front which extends out from a resin stone. I really like the colors in this and the beadwork, but I will admit that the shape is a bit funky. I'm hoping that once the matching costume is finished, it will all come together nicely. One of my earliest hats was inspired by a painting of Isabelle de Requesens, which I recreated. The hat is a simple beret style made from two circles, one of which has another circle cut out of it to create the head opening. It's made from red velvet and lined with quilt batting to puff out the shape. The front has some random beadwork on it meant to imitate the designs on the hat I based it off of. This sits far back on the head and forms almost a halo behind the hair when it's straightened out properly. This is a hat I made before I put a lot of effort into finishing things. It's a bicorn but it doesn't have a cap, so it's tricky to wear. I made this for a historically inspired pirate costume to match a blue jacket. I used ivory jacquard for this with a coordinating fabric binding the seams. It's made from heavyweight interfacing, but has no wire or any form of support sewn into it. Though I don't like the structure, or the lack thereof, I adore the decorations I used on it. I used two shabby appliques on it that have gem sewn to them, along with several plates of goose feathers in matching colors. I made this crown to go with two 14th century costumes. It's made from brass stampings that were soldered together and decorated with rhinestones and they are mounted on a beaded strip of blue velvet. I used colored stones which aren't accurate for the period, but I really like the filigree work on the stampings and the colors of the various stones. It makes my detail-loving heart happy. Something that doesn't make my detail-loving heart happy is all the dust on this. I'm really sorry about that, I don't know how I didn't notice. This is the first flower crown I made and it has a Christmas theme to it since I used Christmas decorations. I made this to go with my first ever Christmas costume back in 2013, and I wore it again in 2014 with my light up dress. I made this because I wanted something to balance out the wide sleeves on the dress I paired it with, and also to help dress up my wig. It definitely did the job, and I still really love the proportions of it, as well as how much it sparkles. It has a base of plastic boning with gathered organza over top. I glued gold holiday decorations and gold poinsettias over top until it took on the shape I wanted. I call this one the Christmas wreath since I think you could hang it on a door and people wouldn't know the difference. I made this in 2014 and wore it last year with another Christmas project. It also has a boning base and is made from wreath supplies, including fake pine sprigs, mini pine cones, glittery pine cones, fake cranberries, sparkly birds, and leaves from various fake flowers. I really like this one since it makes me feel like a holiday painting from the early 1900s. And my final holiday headpiece is the most recent. I actually have a video about this one. It has a silver and brown color scheme with pops of red and white. The base is plastic boning covered in ribbon. The ribbon was decorated with fake branches, cranberries, and crystals. At the front there are two velvet birds, and the whole thing is wrapped in lights to make it glow. Far more delicate than the previous two, and probably my favorite, I'm going to use this as inspiration for my Christmas costume this year. This crown is simply titled Butterfly Crown, since that's what it is. I used a bunch of fake butterflies mounted on wire for this piece. They are attached to wire that I covered with linen, and I attach them in such a way that they stick up at various heights. And the linen band is covered with beads and monties that match the butterflies and add a bit of sparkle. Not a headpiece I pull out often, but if it was socially acceptable, I would wear this all the time because it makes me feel like a magical fairy princess. This is a sailor style hat which have a flat brim and straight cap. 
These were very popular in the late 1800s and often paired with sporting or boating ensembles. They were usually made from straw, but I used heavier materials so it would match the 1890s cycling costume I wanted to pair with it. This is probably the easiest type of hat to make since the pattern is just two ovals and a rectangle. I used wired buckram for the brim and interfacing for the rest of it. It's covered with black wool felt and trimmed with a vintage grey ribbon and a few paper flowers. I lined the brim with a damask print denim and the cap with a fun polka dot fabric. I don't think you can tell, but there are three rows of hand stitching around the brim to secure the lining and wool together. This helps keep everything smooth, which is important when the brim is so thin and so straight. This guy is the first hat I ever made with interfacing and wire. It's also the largest hat I've ever made. It's huge. This was created as part of an Anna de Mendoza inspired ensemble based on a portrait from the mid 1500s and it's made from taffeta with denim lining. For decoration, it has a sash of silk chiffon tied into a bow, along with several ostrich feathers and a few curled rooster feathers. I love the textures of this hat, but my lack of knowledge really shows on this one. I covered the inner facing with flannel before attaching the top layer fabric and lining, which makes the edges really thick and the hat very heavy. I also bound the edges with the thick wool, which isn't the most attractive finish. And a hat of this size really needs a few bands of wire in the brim, and I only added one. So it's not my best work, though I still love all the trimmings that I used. A recent addition to my collection is a hat that was very trendy in the 1860s, and it's called a pork pie hat, named for the fact that it has the shape of a meat pie. The sides are completely straight with an upright brim and domed top. The hat is slightly wider towards the front, with the top edge sloping into a gentle point at the center of the forehead. The brim is trimmed with plaid piping and has several feathers slipped into it, along with a brooch decorating it. The brim of the hat is buckram, but the structure is made from wired interfacing and the top is padded slightly to get the domed effect. All the pieces are covered with black velvet and lined with polka dot cotton. And that, my friends, is the end of my hat and headdress collection. I really hope you enjoyed it, and if you want more information on anything mentioned in this video, please check out the description. And if you have any questions that aren't answered there, feel free to ask. I love talking about my precious collection. Thank you so much for watching, and I shall talk to you all very soon.